born, the day they died, and the cities they were born and died in. Now, these were in the Hebrew text, not, you know, written straight out, but they were equidistant letter sequences. In other words, like every third letter would spell their name, or every fourth letter, or something like this. It could be across, down, diagonally, and only a computer could, could pull all of this information out. The men that they found, the names of the people that they found, were people that lived in the 5th century, 6th century, 10th century, 19th century. Now, the Bible says in the book of Revelations, this book, the book of life. And I, I wondered after I saw this article, I wondered if when people are removing these things, if, in fact, they are removing their own names from the book of life. Because he said, if you will take from the words of the prophecy of this book, God will take your part out of the book of life. And so it may be that our names are written in the Bible. And the day we're born, the day we die, and the city we're born and died in. And he, it, it could be the very Lamb's book of life itself. You know, The Bible says that Jehoiakim in the Old Testament begat Jaconias. And that's an obscure kind of fact that most people don't know. But when you read the book of Matthew, it said Josiah begat Jaconias. And that would appear to be a contradiction. But what God did is he took... Jehoiakim's name out of the Bible because Jehoiakim in, in Jeremiah chapter 36 cut the prophecy of Jeremiah. He destroyed it. And so God took his name out of the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. So uh, God will do what he says he will do. Now, two Harvard and two Yale mathematicians took this statistical science article and evaluated it. And they said the chances of this happening are 1 in 50 quadrillion. And these two unsaved, or four unsaved scholars said, quote, the phenomena cannot be attributed to anything within the known physical universe. They were astonished. And um, I think it's very exciting to know that we have the very words of God. He said, the words that I've spoken unto you, the same will judge you in the last day. And if God's going to judge us by those very words, he must give us each and every single word. Now, there's an interesting sidelight to what's happened here in this research in statistical science, and that is the Hebrew text that they used here is the Hebrew text called the ben Hakim Rabbinic Bible that underlies the King James Version. All right? They tried the same mathematical analysis with the Samaritan Pentateuch, and it didn't work. Um, it does not work with the manuscripts underlying the New International Version, the New American Standard Version, the Living Bible, Good News for Modern Man, Contemporary English Version. It doesn't work with that Hebrew text. That is a different Hebrew text. It's called the Stuttgart Edition, and it's a corrupt edition that was created around the turn of the century by a gentleman named Rudolf Kittel. Now, Rudolf Kittel, when you look his name up in the um, uh, Jewish Encyclopedia, you will find that he is, number one, anti-Semitic, and number two, has contributions in his writings from the Hellenistic mystery religions. And so for those people who knew him at that time, um, he, he appeared to be an anti-Semitic person in his writings. And so the Jewish people have never accepted his Hebrew translation. However, when you go into a Christian bookstore today, what you will find is that Hebrew text underlying the NIV and the NASB and these modern translations. And that's very much in part why they are so different. But I can't imagine God using an anti-Semitic person. As a matter of fact, Rudolf Kittel's son Gerhard um, was tried and convicted of war crimes uh, in the slaughter of uh, the Jewish people. He was Hitler's high priest, and he created slanderous propaganda against the Jewish people. So his whole family had been anti-Semitic. And fortunately, the King James Bible does not use that Hebrew text. Okay, now part of the reason I wrote um, the book New Age Bible Versions, this is the book I wrote, and I spent six years collating the modern translations of the Bible. Uh, years ago, I was not a staunch King James believer. As a matter of fact, when I would write letters to my mother, I would change the Bible any time I wanted to. I really didn't, wasn't educated about the subject, and I was a young Christian. And, but I found that the young ladies who would come into my office at the university, I was a professor, and they knew I was a Christian, and when they had emotional problems, they would come into my office and cry, and I would show them a verse in the Bible or something to help them feel better. 
And I noticed that those who were using the modern translations seemed to be unstable, emotionally depressed, anxious, all those sorts of things. And it made me stop to think perhaps that's why psychology has moved into the church because of some of the problems these versions have caused. But as I was collating those translations, um, impeded by my love for these young people at the university who seemed to be having problems, and I really wasn't quite sure that it was coming from these versions, but I, I saw that there was a problem. Um, I looked in Matthew chapter 418 for Jesus uh, came to heal the broken heart, and that verse is completely omitted in the new versions. Uh, looked at something simple like be of good comfort in Luke chapter 8, entirely omitted. Um, the mercy of God, entirely omitted. As a matter of fact, the mercy seat, which is 53 times in the Old Testament, has been entirely omitted in the NIV. No more mercy seat in the NIV. So it's sort of some kind of a lid now. I don't know what kind of a lid it is. But, um, Mark chapter 3, power to heal the sick, completely omitted. Acts chapter 3, the lame man was healed, completely omitted in the NIV. Okay, now, they've created a caricature of God, I found, in the new versions. For instance, when we've got Ephesians, Jesus nurturing his church. Nurturing comes from the word nurse, as a mother would nurse her children, holding them lovingly. Okay? Or humble, 1 Corinthians 12, God nurtures us and he humbles us. Okay? In the new versions, it says discipline and humiliate. Now, can you imagine, imagine wanting to go to a God who was going to discipline and humiliate you? I can't imagine either. And now I see why those young ladies that I suggested go home and read their Bible would come back and they would be more depressed than they were when they left. Um, now, we're going to be looking at some of the omissions in new versions. And what you will find as we go through these omissions is that the omissions in the new versions serve to make the Bible accommodate other religions. Now, if you were a marketer, you would know that that would increase your market share. If you can include other religions, then you can sell more Bibles. If you can include every denomination, not just born-again Christians, but the liberal, you know, seminaries and the liberal churches, if you can include everyone, obviously you can sell more Bibles. This is what's happened. Now, the main tenant of the New World Religion is tolerance for the religious beliefs of others, all right? Um, so you could say the New World Religion is inclusive. It includes everyone. As a matter of fact, it will even include Christians if you want to join, all right? Now, Christianity is exclusive. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, all right? What you will see in these new versions is that they allow a broader kind of a definition. Now, looking up um, at these samples I've shown you here, a simple verse to teach a child is uh, 1 John 4:14. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Okay, all one-syllable words. But we have one Father, the Father, one Son, one Savior, and one world. Okay? Now, when we look in the new versions, NIV and NASB, you will see that they have a God, one of many, who sends a Son or avatar um, with a message to each age. And so with the new versions, you will see a gospel, a message, a God, a Son, a Savior, and an age, rather than the God, the Son, the Savior, and the world. One way or many ways. Okay. Now, um, one question you might ask your friends or ask yourself is, do I have a holy Bible? Now, this is a cover of a new international version. Okay. And um, after collating it, I really didn't feel that I wanted to keep the rest of it, so, but I did keep the cover. Um, but it says, Holy Bible on the cover. So let's do a little investigation and see if it, in fact, is a Holy Bible and if this is truth in advertising. Okay. Now, remember there was just one ark, okay? There's just one Savior, one God, and there's also just one Bible, as you'll come to see. Now, notice the King James says, Holy Men. Now, that comes from Peter, where it says, Holy Men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Scriptures came from Holy Men. When we look at the NIV, it just says, men. At least they're honest and they admit that they weren't holy men that wrote it. Uh, when we look at Matthew 25, we have the holy angels. Now, we know in Second Peter there are angels that sinned. We know the angels, there are angels that left their first estate. Revelation talks about the devil and his angels. So all angels are not holy angels. And so 
we must distinguish the holy angels from the unholy angels. But I'm, I'm afraid the new versions don't do that. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 talks about the holy brethren. Okay, now, unfortunately, in Timothy, it says, In the last days, men shall be unholy. Well, no wonder they're unholy, because it doesn't say holy in front of brethren in their Bible.